Hello everyone, welcome to the Tolkien Road, episode 232, The Book of Lost Tales 1, part 1. Mm. Greta? Hey, hey, shaking? hey. Uh, not a whole lot. Yeah? No. Um, you know, keeping it real. Um, Keep going. Yeah. Got a lot of, you know, a lot of theme song to, to one, play out here. One foot Woody in Banter. front of the other, and... Trying to keep up and yeah. all the things, and I'm too close to the microphone. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, good. Good, good. How are you? I am, uh, I'm doing okay. I'm yeah? hanging in there. Good. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, on this episode, we are continuing our After the Silmarillion series as we begin our survey of the history of Middle Earth. This episode will focus on Christopher Tolkien's Forward to the History of Middle Earth, Volume 1, The Book of Lost Tales 1. So, a lot of... Volume one, part one. I was gonna say there's a lot of business going on there. A lot of ones. Yeah. In so there. we'll talk about that. Before we get started, we'd like to give a shout out to our patrons. Special thanks to this episode's executive producers, Caitlin of T with Tolkien, Lise Yu, Andrew T, John R, and our newest executive producer, Ms. Anonymous, who boosted her pledge. Awesome. So, yeah. Thanks, long time guys. long time patron there, and uh, she boosted her pledge. So That's thank you awesome. very much, Ms. Anonymous. Yes, thank you. We are uh we got a lot of executive producers now. It's a good place to be. I mean, I'll use all. I'll take all the executive producers we can get. No, we'll, we'll spend the first twenty minutes of each episode just calling out executive producers. If you got, if you guys want to go that route, so yeah, I'm all for it. Could be fun. Seriously, thank you all, and yes. um, uh, you know, especially thanks for boosting your pledge on a, a week when we weren't able to deliver on an episode. So really appreciate that. Yes, really do. yeah. Uh, we also want to give a shout out to our newest patrons, Robert H. and Payne Joyker. Pain Ooh, Joker. I think I'm saying that right. Okay. So, awesome. thank you all. Yeah, thanks for becoming patrons. Yes. Thank you, thank you. You too can become a patron of the Tolkien Road by visiting patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Becoming a patron lets you support the show in a tangible way and land you some awesome perks like video recordings of our episodes. Check it out now to learn more about all the exciting perks we offer. And don't forget, you can now make an annual pledge and get one month free. So Yeah, it's a good deal. You can also support us by leaving a one-time tip. Just go to find our website and then uh, find an episode and click the blue button that says leave a tip. Subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. Leave us a five-star rating and uh, and say what you love about the podcast. And uh, and head on over to our YouTube channel and subscribe. Um, it's, you know, I, I was cranking out some videos there for a little while and it's kind of slowed down a little bit, but hoping to get back on that train here real soon. So, um, yeah. So that's uh, that's kind of all the beginning stuff as normal as you guys are now accustomed to. Um, so before we dive in, I just wanted to say thanks to all of you for your patience and understanding uh, as we missed a week last week. Uh, I've been really trying to stay on that train for the last year or so, you know, get getting it out every week and um, I was doing pretty well. Um, but the reason for our absence was to visit my father, Nat. Uh, Nat Carswell, who passed away on March 3rd after a long illness. It was a huge blessing to be able to be with him in his last few days. Obviously, my dad meant so much to our family. To borrow a phrase from him, he was good people. Um, if you could see Greta right now, you would uh, see You're her smiling make me and agreeing. Cry. <laughs> um, as for his interest to this podcast community, I think there are two things that jump out to me. First, one summer when I was a kid, my dad wanted to prevent me from spending the whole summer in the basement playing video games. So he told me to read The Hobbit and write a book report on it. This is my first experience with Tolkien. Little did I know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, I wish I had that book report still. I, you know, I, I can clearly remember, like, and I don't think I, like, com immediately latched on to The Hobbit either. But I remember writing that book report and, giving and like, giving it to my dad and, um... You know, I, I don't know if he graded it, if he hung on to it. Maybe we'll find it. If we if we ever do find it when we're going through his things or anything like that, then I will definitely bring it on here and read it to you guys. So that would be awesome. Yeah, that would that be really would be cool. really cool. That would be that would be really cool. Also, props to your dad for making you write a book report during <laughs> summer vacation. I think it was I think it was just like <laughs> you're playing way too much Nintendo this summer, so you need to actually get off Gosh. your butt and or you know if you're gonna stay on your butt, then you need to like do something that's actually gonna feed your mind. Yeah, use so, your brain. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that was your first introduction. Yeah, to Tolkien. Yeah. Absolutely, it was. Well, how about that? Um, second, my dad introduced me to Narnia and C.S. Lewis at a very young age, and this was, of course, a springboard 
into the sort of Christian mysticism through which I have always viewed the world and which eventually led me to a passion for Tolkien's works. So my dad introduced me to C.S. Lewis at a young age, and of course we all know the you know C.S. Lewis and Tolkien connection. Um, and and I have to think that that really laid the groundwork for me to like latch onto Tolkien, eventually latch onto Tolkien the way that I did. So uh, pretty much pretty much what I'm saying is um, you know, my dad's responsible for this podcast. So <laughs> I guess you kind of land there. Um, I should also mention that when he met Greta, he told me that if I screwed this up, he disowned me. So I didn't really need, I didn't really need convincing of course, but surely that contributed in some degree to her sitting here with us right now. Wow. That's, that, that's cool. Yeah. That makes my heart happy. So I just want to use this opportunity to bid my father a Tolkienian farewell as he sets out on his journey across the great sea unto the blessed realm on the other shore. Um, in the words of Gandalf, here at last, dear friend, on the shore of the sea comes the end of our fellowship in Middle Earth. Go in peace. I will not say, do not weep, for not all tears are in evil. So good. And I'm, I'm so good. I got plenty I'm, of them right now. <laughs> I'm good. Greta's <laughs> taking care of all the tears of, of the tears for me. It's not because it's not because I'm not sad that my dad's gone. I'm just not much of a crier. Like I really am not. Except except when one of our pets dies. Then I'm like, then I lose. Yes, it. you did. So, you cried way more than I did no, when we lost y'all, our cat. Um, I, I really do appreciate your patience and uh, and for all the you know I, I shared I shared the reason I we missed last week with our Patreon community, um, and I just want to thank everybody who reached out and said, hey, praying praying for you, praying for your dad. I just thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Um, it's really awesome to have you guys praying for us, um, and. It, it it really means a lot all of the well wishes um it when you go through something like this you can you can feel it you know you can feel that um you can feel those good vibes coming your way so definitely yeah um but yeah i'm gonna miss my dad um uh, it was it was a good it you know we all we all know we're all we're all tolkien fans so it's it's kind of before us at all times we all know that that death is a um, is a reality of our existence, and um, <clears throat> uh, and so we all know we're going to face it at some point. And um, you know, all things considered, um, my dad's passing from this world was a um, you know was what I'd call a good one, right? Um, yeah, I would too. Um, we all got to be with him, and he was he was kind of resigned to knowing that you know it was going to be soon, and um, it allowed us to all be resigned, and it also allowed him to really st- to die well, you know, um, mm-hmm. to die in a place that left us with you know really the best of him, you know, agreed, the best part of him. So for sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks again for all your prayers. Yes, thank you. Any anything else you want to say, Greta, before we move on? I'm going to be a blubbering mess if I try to talk right now. <laughs> Even more than I already am. Um, well, all right. Well, then let's dive into the Book of Lost Tales, shall we? Sounds good. All right. Let's do it. Okay. So part one of two on the first volume of the History of Middle Earth. So we are looking at a... Um, I always I always want to say it's, it's 12 volumes, but I always feel like maybe it's 13. I always get this thing in my mind, like maybe it's 13 volumes. But I think I think it's 13 sometimes because of the index, but I could have that number wrong, so I'll have to double-check myself before the next episode. But we're looking at Volume 1 of the History of Middle-Earth, The Book of Lost Tales 1, and this is going to be a two-parter, so two parts on Volume 1. This week we're going to we're going to discuss the uh, the foreword to The Book of Lost Tales because it's a long essay by Christopher, and it kind of, um, it kind of explains why he's undertaking this whole History of Middle-Earth business in the first place. So, and, and what the Book of Lost Tales is. So the Book of Lost Tales 1 was first published in 1983. In brief, it is the first version of the stories that would later become the Silmarillion. On this episode, we will be exploring Christopher's Forward, which is something like a flagship essay for the entire History, history of Miller series that would follow. So, Greta, are you tracking so far? Um, I think so. Okay. Well, so interject th- with questions. Well, considering I didn't realize that we were going to be doing the Middle Earth, what's it called again? The, the history, history of Middle, Middle Earth. Earth. Yeah. It took me a while to figure out that that was what we were doing. So I'm, 
Well, you knew we were doing you. You knew we were doing that. Well, Although I thought I we were doing unfinished tales, so I was confused. Oh, we finished unfinished tales. See, <laughs> I didn't think that was possible. Or we finished our <laughs> survey of unfinished tales. So, so okay, so we're doing the history of Middle Earth series. Yeah, and this is the first book in that series. Yeah, is called what? It's called the it's called the Book of Lost Tales one, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, and you and we're talking about the foreword to the first book of the History of Middle Earth series. You are correct. Which is called the Book of Lost Tales. The Book of Lost Tales one. Got no, this it. is good. I'm glad okay. you're asking this. So, um, you know, we're we're kind of getting we're kind of getting back to when we first started the podcast with some of this, right? Because it's like, oh, you know. I'm just like, it's okay. I think y'all, y'all, she's, <laughs> she was, she was crying a little bit. So I'm trying you know. to pull myself together. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, if you don't like the sniffles, then deal with it. So <laughs> I'm going to turn up, I'm turn up the gain on the sniffles. Go find another podcast where people don't have feelings. That's right. Good, good one. <laughs> um, okay. So, okay. So you were saying that we're going back to the beginning of when we started the podcast? Well, no, no, no. I'm what I'm saying is this is kind of like when we started at the beginning and it was we were going through the Silmarillion which you I th- I'm not sure. I don't think you had ever read the Silmarillion I'd never before. Had, yeah. No. So you didn't really know what you were getting into as opposed to like Lord of the Rings which we already obviously spent a lot of time with and The Hobbit mm-hmm. which you had both read before. Mm-hmm. You had read both of them before. Right, I was familiar. Um, yeah. so this is a little more like those were a little bit more like we were kind of on equal footing, mm-hmm. right? Okay, um, yes. But yeah. this one is more like I'm I'm back in the teacher and you're like, what is this? What are we, do- what are we doing kind of mode? <laughs> okay. So good. I just hope there's, there's not gonna be a whole lot of mansplaining in my future. Well, I am a I man just, and I, I shall be explaining things. Don't know so that I can I'll take it. Do my best, I guess. <laughs> so. Okay. Uh, well, you so far you've done a good job. Okay. Of good. not mansplaining. So, okay. So the foreword written by well, Christopher. Well, sweetie. You just let me know if I start mansplaining. I, I will do that. Okay. Yeah. That was kind of like me trying to like do I, like I some heavy it. handed mansplaining. Yeah, I so, got it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, all right. So the book of lost tales written between 60 and 70 years ago, more like uh, 90 or a hundred years ago at this point was the first substantial work of imaginative, imaginative literature by J.R.R. Tolkien and the first emergence and narrative of the Valar of the children of Iluvatar, elves and men of the dwarves and the orcs and of the lands in which their history is set. Valinor beyond the Western Ocean and Middle Earth, the great lands between the seas of East and West. Some 57 years after my father ceased to work on the Lost Tales, the Silmarillion, profoundly transformed from its distant forerunner, was published, and six years have passed since then. This forward seems a suitable opportunity to remark on some aspects of both works. So that's Christopher writing in 1983. So just to break that down, this is 1983 when he publishes this. The Silmarillion had already been out for six years, right? And then Unfinished Tales had already been out for three years at this point, right? So he's going back all the way to the beginning of when his father had started writing about Middle Earth, okay? This is, the Book of Lost Tales was basically the first collection of legends that, of Middle Earth legends that Tolkien put to paper, right? Going back into the, uh, you know, really the time of, of World War One, So why you know so so that's what he's doing that's what we're going to be looking at with this and then the question is why is he doing this got it right why okay. is christopher going going back in time to this point and doing it this way now is the silmarillion part of the series or no is it its own standalone thing good question Thank so you. the silmarillion remember is when when he published the silmarillion he actually he actually had to kind of work with some, with another author to um to like basically put something together Mm -hmm. right to to put it all together because there was Tolkien had written so much he had revised uh he had revised parts over the years um there were like notes over here and and long passages over here and well-developed stories over here and Christopher kind of had to synthesize it all into one complete thing right to publish as the Silmarillion right so Tolkien Uh did not on his you know on his deathbed did not hand Christopher the, the Silmarillion completed and be like, here, my son published mm-hmm, this. Mm-hmm. It was more like dad, dad died with it in a, you know, in an incomplete state. Right. And now I'm the one who's going to finish it and deliver it to the world. Right. Right. Or, or at least edit it and collect it and deliver it to the world. And that's what we know is the Silmarillion. That's what we know is the Silmarillion. However, you might remember from when discussing unfinished tales that 
Christopher, by the time Unfinished Tales came out, was already kind of feeling a little bit um, uneasy with how the yes. su- how he had handled the yeah. Silmarillion, right? I do remember that now. Um, yes. and and we see more of that in this forward. Okay. Okay. So he's he's really wrestling with like, you know, did I do did I do my father's work justice? And I almost kind of see <laughs> the rest of Christopher's life. Right, we get, again, we, we said there's there's two paths, like kind of, there's three paths he could have gone down. He could have just chosen to publish nothing, right? Uh, this this other path he could have gone down would be to like just start letting other authors kind of do whatever in Middle Earth, right? Or try it himself, right. or let other authors do do whatever in Middle Earth, right? And then the third path he could have gone down is what he eventually chose to do, which is to pr- basically provide like a, a textual history of of middle earth right and the development of middle earth so so that's what we're looking at here okay okay um and so um you know you can kind of look at unfinished tales as his first stab at doing that i guess he felt like he was pretty happy with how that turned out and so he launched into and he's like i'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning and i'm gonna give people the book of lost tales these stories that they'll recognize and they'll you know but they're different you know, they're, they're in many ways substantially different from the stories that were eventually delivered in the Silmarillion, right? Mm-hmm. And he started mm-hmm. this with the goal of eventually delivering like a full history of how these stories developed over time, right? Gotcha. Yes. So Christopher okay. just didn't. It it seems like it really comes down to he just didn't want his. He didn't want people. It it was super important to him that the world had what his father had written as opposed to what Christopher had sent, had, had simply synthesized. Right. Mm. You know, um, yes. He okay. wanted people, he, I guess he wanted people to have both, right. He wanted, he wanted people to have the Silmarillion, but then he wanted people to be able to dig in and say like, here's how these stories developed over time. It, it, it almost, I mean, to me, honestly, it feels, it, it does feel a little bit idiosyncratic. Right. And, um, you know, it's like, why, you know, why, why, I mean, I guess I understand why you'd want to do that. And, but it's, you know, it's, it's not, I think the route that most people would have taken, you know, if, if they were the, if they were the, you know, inheritor of a incredible literary legacy, right. Mm-hmm. Um, is this the path that they would choose? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's maybe old school they would have. Um, but, um, I don't know. I even think of like, I don't know. There's, there's this, um, there's this book about the Battle of Gettysburg called Killer Angels, and it's by Michael Shera, and it's the the movie Gettysburg was based on it, right? And um, and there's a whole, and then he he died pretty young, I think, and then his son Jeff Shera has like done a whole like like basically picked up his father's legacy and run with it, like like mm. s- sprinted with it, right? Um, and he's basically he wrote. The prequel to Gettysburg, which was basically the American Civil War before Gettysburg, and then he wrote the sequel to Gettysburg, which was the American Civil War after Gettysburg, and then he went all the way back to the Revolutionary War, and he wrote a series of books on those, and the War of 1812, and uh, the uh, American-Mexican War, and um, and all the way into the Great War, and World War II, and Korea. Like, he's done, he basically just made this his thing, right, mm. where he writes these books, and they're, they're I mean, I enjoy them, you know, I've, the ones I've read, I've enjoyed um, and they're like historical fiction. Okay. So, you know, you kind of wonder like, why wouldn't you go that route? Right. Um, and I, I mean, Christopher is basically trying to explain to us why he chose, why he's chosen to go this route. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But with, as with everything, I feel like with Christopher, it's not always easy to just, easy to just arrive at a clear, right. succinct yeah. answer. But no, what I'm trying to do here is maybe try to get closer to that heart, you know, um, you know, at least try to, uh, yeah, try to John Splain for Christopher. So, <laughs> <laughs> might not be very successful. We'll see. Is this all making sense you to you? You didn't even answer my question. Where did I? What? Is the Silmarillion part of the series or not? No, we've already done the Silmarillion. Okay, so it's not part of the history of Middle Earth. No, 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 no. That's what I was wondering. Okay, well. <laughs> okay. Now you know. I thought I was just asking a yes or no question. Now you need to make sure you're in the camera well enough. There, you lean forward, Do and then I we though? can't see you. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for answering my question. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. You just want to lean in. All I right. Do. Yes. Okay. Um, where was I? All right. Yeah. So, uh, so Christopher is basically saying. Um, so Christopher goes on this forward to basically say, why is the 
you know, to ask why is the Silmarillion and all of, and basically all of this stuff before Lord of the Rings so hard. And he lists off three reasons. Um, and in all of this, I should say he's interacting with Tom Shippey, right? The professor, the Tolkienian, mm. the Tolkien, you know, the, uh, the, the professor kind of written a bunch of books on Tolkien, one of the gold standards, right? Of uh, Tolkien scholarship. Uh, and Christopher says, first of all, there's no hobbits to mediate, right? There's no hobbits to mediate any of this, which is a, uh, you know, Tom Shippey points out and is a, and is a recognized issue. And Tolkien himself kind of mm-hmm. got, right? You know, yeah. he's They're... like, ah, I'm not sure people are going to like this. There's not really hobbits to help, you know, help make it. Yeah, relatable. More and relatable, yeah. Yeah, more down to earth. Yeah. Um, the second one is that it's not, the style is not novelistic <clears throat> in convention. Um so it's not a, um, it, it's not it's not like it follows like one character from start to finish. It's more like a collection of, of legends of inter, like legends that are interwoven, uh, and take place within the same continuum. But you know, there it doesn't follow just the story of one particular you know one particular individual or even a couple of of heroes like from right. start to finish. Right. Right. So it's not cohesive in that way. <clears throat> right. Yeah. The third thing that Christopher. Uh, Christopher thinks might be an issue is um, this is a little harder to get at, but basically what he, what he's saying is that there's less impression of depth. So one of the things that Christopher and, and Tom Shippey recognize as a, um, is one of the great appeals of Lord of the Rings is its impression of depth. And so much, you know, when you've read the Silmarillion and you go back and read the Lord of the Rings, you can appreciate so much more of the Lord of the Rings that you might have been prone to skip over before because you're like, oh, that's, you know, they're referring to Baron and Luthien there, you know, or, um, you know, they're, they're referring to this other legend from the Silmarillion, right? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the things that Tolkien himself feared was that when people went back to these stories, um, when they actually had these stories themselves, it would be kind of like, well, I guess we've reached bottom, right? I guess we've reached bottom with this whole thing. Um, you know, you can't really go back any further than that, I guess. Um, and so that the kind of the, the, the enchantment of having that depth in Lord of the Rings of being able to say like, there's thousands of years of history that go back here. Mm -hmm. Now that you have that, is it going to be as interesting anymore? Right. It's like, is there no more undiscovered country? Right. You know, uh, kind of to deal with here. Right. Um, it's kind of like how people feel sometimes when they're like, oh, you know, the world's been explored now, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's, you know, it's like, because of the modern world, like it's so easy to get you know, all the way to the other side of the world, relatively easy to get to the other side of the world nowadays, that it's like the world feels flat, right? Hmm. Um, and so Christopher worried that once they, you know, once they had these, since we had these stories now, it would make things seem less deep. But, and he and he says this, but I don't think that's really true, right? I think once you have, once you have, if, if, if the legends themselves are deep and, um, and, and, and show us, enough then we continue to ask questions about them right Mm -hmm. we continue to wrestle with them we continue to want to see deeper into you know these stories and even more about how they interconnect at the end of the day with the silmarillion you're dealing with still you're still dealing with thousands of years of history if you start from the you know the music of the ainur all the way through to um uh, all the way through to the uh you know the end of the second age and and even into the third age right so um so you're dealing with tons, tons of history um, from the beginning of time all the way to Lord of the Rings or to The Hobbit. So, you know, I don't think that's something that I think that's something that is like a very pessimistic, but but not a very realistic fear, you know, um, yeah, that's that that somehow going back and hearing these stories that were only alluded to is going to rob them of their of their beauty and of your desire to want to go even further into the legendarium. So is is he talking there kind of about like like um not leaving enough mis- mystery behind yeah. like answering all the questions and right. things like like that. That's interesting. I I kind of feel like it would do the opposite. Yeah, well, you know, that's the thing is, you know, anybody who has like explored a mystery is like you know, so, sometimes you do like find sufficient answers to mm-hmm. things, but mm-hmm. but even when you find sufficient answers to a particular question that you're curious about, it doesn't take long until other questions start popping into your mind, right? Mm-hmm. Um, even, even when you think something is a settled matter. And and I think here, like, I mean, 
you know, there's there's so many questions like to grapple with that within Middle Earth. Um, and there's there's whole like characters that you know are barely explored right even by Tolkien himself Mm -hmm. and just his own ability like to you know get lost on writing like you know having to reconcile like the entire history of Galadriel or something like of one character or something like that shows you just how you know how you could you know this does not rob anybody of uh of depth ultimately right right I feel like he's giving his dad a ton of credit yeah in that criticism like basically saying Oh yeah, by you know, by writing all this, he's basically solved everything, and there's going to be nothing else left to the imagination. Right. You know, I mean, it just it, it's maybe I feel like maybe it's more of a result of him having his dad just kind of up on that pedestal. Not that he didn't belong there, right. but I know I know we talked about this before about why Christopher decided to go the route he did was out of. A tremendous amount the, the tremendous amount of respect he had for mm-hmm. his father and what he had written and just created so right. um i feel like this is maybe a, a symptom of that of just that incredible respect and you know awe really that he had for his dad yeah and i his mean works. certainly like and 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 i mean that just shines through that completely shines through in his whole approach and wanting to go this direction instead of like you know, he must have just thought, like, there's no way I can, like, hold a candle to mm-hmm. what my father mm-hmm. did as a storyteller. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm more, much more interested in in him um, and, and, and making sure all of his legacy and the and everything he put into these things is is available to the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, Tolkien himself had doubts about the undertaking to publish the Silmarillion. He did try to get it published many, you know, frequently mm-hmm. um, at, a, at a couple of key junctures in his life. Um, but... Christopher makes it clear that he never had he never had any doubts about writing the stories. It was more about whether whether publishing them ultimately would be a good idea. Right. 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 Um, you know, it's like, you know, here's my here's my special hobby. Is anybody really going to really going to like this stuff? And, you know, again, it's like, you know, towards the end of his life is, you know, in, into the mid 60s when it just started taking off like crazy. You know, he just had to have thought to himself like. Wow. <laughs> like everybody really likes my like little weird hobby that I had. <laughs> this is amazing, you know? Yeah. Surprising. Um, but it must've just been too, like, this can't be real. Like this, you know, this kind of like this, this people care about all this stuff I wrote about. They, they really do, you know? Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. Well, that's a, that's a real sign of humility too. Yeah. You know? Um, so yeah. So, um, so Christopher, another thing he jumps into is that the Silmarillion has no frame, right? So um, one of the things that I feel like hinders the Silmarillion is that there isn't a frame narrative, right? I Or let me say it this way. Actually, I think it's an interesting question of whether it hinders it or not. But I do wonder if more people would be able to, would be able to uh, get into the Silmarillion more easily if it was provided with a, like, Hobbit frame narrative, right? It's like... Bilbo and Frodo having a conversation, right? You know, about mm. the Red Book of Westmarch, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they, you know, they just get into talking about all these different things or like, you know, if they, if it's like, you know, or maybe it's like, you know, Bilbo with young Frodo, right? You know, before, before the Lord of the Rings happens or like young Frodo and Sam sitting around, oh, right? Oh, interesting. And, okay. um, and they're like, oh, you know, Uncle Bilbo, tell us about, you know, tell us about, um, you know, the story of Baron and Luthien or tell us about, you know, um, you know, the, the story. And, and like, I wonder like if, if a frame would have helped make it more accessible, make the Silmarillion more accessible like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, that kind of frame narrative. Kind of like how Aragorn, when he's telling the tale of, of Baron and Luthien in Lord of the Rings, like something like, right. Like that. And what's really interesting, and we're going to, we're going to look at this next week when we look at the, you know, do a survey of the contents of the book of Lost Tales, but the book of Lost Tales actually has a frame. It actually has a frame. It's not a oh. Hobbit frame, but it is a there is a frame nonetheless, hmm. uh, nonetheless, and it's called the uh, the Cottage of Lost Play. So we'll talk about what that frame entails on the next episode. But um, yeah, in the Book of Lost Tales, it was originally told through the frame of a man who comes over the sea to to the island where the elves live and learns their history. Hmm. And it later seems that Bilbo's Red Book of Westmarch was to be the frame, though it was never fully employed. Right. So oh. the book that Bilbo hands to Frodo 
and is eventually handed over to Sam, um, you know, the thought is that that was, that could have been like Bilbo was collecting all these legends that were, you know, he had been told like by Elrond or somebody, right. And, and Gandalf and, uh, and Aragorn and could collect them and, um, and, and hand them over to Frodo to finish. Right. Gotcha. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Greta, mm-hmm. what do you think? Do you think a frame narrative would have improved the readability of the Silmarillion? I think so. Yeah. I think it would have. Yeah, because I think that's one of the, um, when I was reading it for the first and only time, it, it, it uh, it's hard to it's hard to feel like you're gaining traction because mm-hmm. there's not you know like there'll be the a great exciting story like Baron and Luthien and then all of a sudden you're back into the history of you know this or that and right. it doesn't it's hard to it's hard to find the connection between it um on you know without knowing a lot more I feel mm-hmm. like it's hard to to know how all of these like why is this even in one book? It's hard to to figure that out because it it isn't very cohesive. Um, so I, yeah, I I think it would be. I think a frame narrative would have helped personally. Yeah, I think I think a well executed frame narrative could have done a great job as well. Like, mm-hmm. um, and especially I think that that could have solved the problem of, of no hobbits, right? Like it's That's like true. Um, you know, like just put every you know like every couple of chapters or even every chapter is just like you know. You know, one night, Bilbo and Frodo, you know, Frodo asked Bilbo to tell him a story about Baron and Luthien or something like that, you mm-hmm. know, or like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, tell me, um, you know, tell me about the battles of uh, of Beleriand, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. just something along those lines that could have, you know, that could have introduced and, and provided that context for people. Right. Yeah. Um, so context. Yes. Yeah. I think that's I think that would have been helpful. Yeah. So. Anyway, we didn't get that, um, and you know, but we're going to see that it's as Tolkien originally conceived it. There was supposed to be a frame narrative. So, anyway, maybe one of these days they can. I don't know. Maybe they can do it. You know, in the future, somebody can come up with a, a, a cool frame for the Silmarillion or something like that, or for the different chapters of the Silmarillion. Mm. I kind of like the idea. I like the idea too. Make All right. To something. So. At the end of the day, we'll never have quite the Silmarillion J.R.R. Tol- Tolkien would have given us. Christopher's problem is that we have is that what we have is insufficiently his father's, but it's also an unsolvable problem. So, pull up a quote here. He says, But the author's vision of his own vision underwent a continual slow shifting, shedding, and enlarging. Only in the, Lord, in the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings did part of it emerge to become fixed in print in his own lifetime. The study of Middle-earth and Valinor is thus complex, for the object of the study was not stable, but exists, as it were, longitudinally in time, the author's lifetime, and not only transversely in time, as a printed book that undergoes no essential further change. By the publication of the Silmarillion, the longitudinal was cut transversely, and a kind of finality imposed. So, again, that's the problem that Christopher is struggling with here, right? Is it really right to call what his father never finished the final product of it all. So question we can't it's really, a little bit of a brain teaser. It is. It is a little bit of a brain teaser and, uh, and Christopher doesn't really answer it <laughs> directly. So, um, all right. So what is the book of lost tales? Uh, it's a work begun by Tolkien in 1916 through 17 during the great war, but never quite completed. Um, so he began it during world war one when he was of course an officer in the British army and um and and so it's it's basically a you know a series of notebooks right um and a word is the earliest version of what we now know as the silmarillion and it's and it's literally was written down in these various notebooks um but not exactly ready for publication right it was mm-hmm. more like it, at that point chris you know tolkien probably never thought it would become you know it would be it would ever be published by anybody right it was more like this is him doing his little hobby Right. Um, and, you know, if you know, if you're a creative type, you kind of you kind of understand. Right. You know, you pro- you might have a if you're a visual artist, you might have a sketchbook of just stuff like, you know, you just sketch and stuff. Right. And you're like, probably never be published. Of course, it's a lot easier to publish something online now. But, um, you know, you can just self-publish. But back then, self, you know, that was really there. Were no one no one self-published. Um, and. Uh, or, you know, you might be a writer and have like a notebook full of like different stories and that kind of thing. Or, um, 
you know, you might be a songwriter and have like a bunch of songs that you've made for yourself and, but no one else will probably ever hear. Right. So that's kind of what this was for Tolkien. Um, and even with this early compilation, we see the legendarium and the stories developing, especially in the way of names. So they're still under development. Even we're going to see in, as we go through, um, that these stories, even what we get here in the book of lost tales one are, develop right he, he went back and edited them even in these notebooks right um early on so um even then they weren't really like a fixed final thing so there's going to be a lot of the same characters and stories mm -hmm. in here that there are in the stone Marillion. yes but the, uh, the bit one of the biggest differences is that they're they're going to have different names from like creatures and uh and characters are going to actually have different names or you even have different descriptions of what they're like right oh. yeah okay so we're going to we're going to take note of some of those things along the way, not of all of them, but we'll take note of some of them, uh, just the more interesting ones. And, um, you know, and so what what Christopher does is he says his basic approach is to introduce each chapter with the physical context, basically the description of the notebook where it is found, provide the text as it is when possible, and then provide commentary and notes at the end. So he tries okay. to he tries to say. Uh, it was in this notebook that I found this, and uh, here's what he wrote, and he, he, you know, in his handwriting, and he put, he put we get the text, and then at the end, Christopher provides a commentary and notes for each each chapter. So, all right, yeah, very thorough. Yeah, so the Book of Lost Tales takes up two volumes of the history of Middle Earth, so okay. we're going to spend at least three episodes on the Book of Lost Tales because it's two volumes of the history of Middle Earth, and we're doing two parts of the first one. So we'll see Got how it. many we do for the second one. Okay. So. Okay. Are we going to go through the whole book? Yeah, but I mean, just like we did with Unfinished Tales, where it's just kind of a, we survey oh, the, the chapters. Survey. Yeah, we're not going to go through each each individual chapter. Gotcha. Right? Kind of like a bird's eye view. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Sounds good. Right on. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any uh, any questions about that? I think you answered all my questions. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks. All right. So, um, yeah, we're going to hit a couple of... Uh, I've still got a lot of feedback we need to get to. We're going to hit a couple of those on this episode and, you know, maybe next week we'll have a little more time to get to some. Okay. Pulling up the email here. All right. This is from Riff M and Riff sent this on February 25th. I just listened to episode 222 is Middle Earth Pagan. As a pagan and heathen myself, I personally do not claim Tolkien for any religious worldview. He was not only Roman Catholic, but very much in love with mythology, literature, and the English countryside, which includes all that wonderful folklore. Tolkien drew on the human condition, regardless of any particular religious view. This is why so many different people still love the man's glorious work. Keep up the great work, John and Greta. All right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I agree. Yep. Yeah. I mean, um, to acknowledge different influences is not to, you know, say that that, uh, you know, to, to say that it's like, you know, that's that's how you have to see this particular thing. Um, you know, it's uh, I think Tolkien, even though he said he even though he did say things like it's a you know, it's a it's a conscientious, uh, uh, consciously religious and Christian work. I'm butchering that right now because my brain is kind of fried. But um, even in saying something like that, you know, he wasn't trying to say, and, you know, you have to read it through this perfectly like Christian lens, right? You know, no, it, it's it's always going to be a standalone work, right? It's always mm -hmm. going to be a work that's meant to stand as itself, yes. right? Yep. So, um, yeah, good stuff. Thanks, Riff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is from Maryland the Librarian on February 5th. Here we go. And Marilyn says, and this was in response to our uh, uh, interview with Holly Ordway, she said, a PS promoted by your conversation with uh, Holly Ordway, I think that Tolkien was uncomfortable with Piper at the Gates of Dawn from Wind in the Willows because of the word worship. He was concerned to keep recognizable formal religion out of his legendarium, Numenor being the one exception, because in part he felt that such references would push readers out of the secondary world being created in the writing. I also su suspect that any suggestions of worshiping a pagan deity, even by animal beings, would disturb him. But these are all my own speculations. Yeah, so um, you know, I think those, I think you know, those are probably those are probably spot on. Um, you know, 
again, like I, you know, this gets to, he didn't want to be, he, he didn't, he, I don't think he thought any, any like work should be like work of fiction should be a, like, you know, a, a work to like proclaim a religious dogma, right. Or to pro- like to proclaim religious views. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I think the second reason you lay out is probably like seems to make more sense to me at least like that he was, he was um, he was a little bit just wary of like the of like kind of the the polytheistic sort of worship maybe that he found in it, um, you know that here's this um, you know here's this pagan deity that uh, this that this animal is you know worshiping but it's a personified animal right um, I don't know it's. Th- those are possible explanations. It would just be a really interesting one to ask Tolkien himself and ask why he was, why yeah. he got, why he stumbled at that. Mm-hmm. So, cause mm-hmm. I think it's really cool. I just, you know, as a, as a fellow Christian, I think it's really cool. Like just that scene and in, in terms of like, just kind of like this numinous awe and, um, you know, just being in the presence of something that's like sacred. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and so I don't know, I've always, I, I I thought that was a really cool um, you know I, I think that's a really cool passage. Anyway, all right. Um, next up is from David Bigwood from February first. David says thank you for an excellent discussion with Dr. Ordway about her work. I'll have to give it a read. A couple comments. Not just Sam was brown. At the end of the Hobbit, the description of hobbits is that they had long, clever brown fingers. Mm. I'd guess the rest of them was also brown. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they just kept their fingers, you know, like say. in the sun, yeah, right? uh, all the time. But yeah. yeah, I mean, that would make sense. An interesting book to poke about in in is Tolkien's library, an annotated checklist by Oranzo. Uh, Ch- I think it's Chilili, uh, C I. I can't read it. It's, print's too small. My eyes. Uh, Chili. I think it's or- Oranzo Sealy or Chili. It lists all the books Tolkien was known to have read or owned or referenced. Mm. Not a book to read, but the place to see what books he was aware of. For instance, you'll find where he mentions The Wind in the Willows or Babbitt. I guess most college libraries would have a copy probably in reference, so it can't be checked out. So. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Wow. That is interesting. That would be a pretty cool thing like to be so like to be so important that you have just a reference about the books that you had in your library as an individual. <laughs> yeah. That would mean you have arrived. Yes, that would mean you're important. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks, David. Yes, thank you. All right, um, next up is from Dan I on February 22nd. Dan writes, hello, John and Greta. I would love to know your favorite Middle-earth characters. Um, All right, well, before I read the rest of his note, what do you think, Greta? You're on the spot. Oh, I am on the spot. Um, well, I mean, like we talked about this before, Sam is really hard. It's hard for me to, uh, to do better than Sam. Um, but I think a close second for me is Arwen. Arwen. Yeah. 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 Nice. I just like her, uh, you know, I don't know. It's like a lot of things about her. Oh, wait, you were making this motion. So you're, you're strong. You mean Eowyn? Yep. I meant Eowyn. (laughs) Yep. My mushy brain. Yes. (laughs) I know, I know. We yes, Why our brains Tolkien are a little mushy this week, do y'all. That? So. <laughs> Why does he give his characters similar names? I meant Eowyn. Well, Ar- Arwen and Eowyn get mixed. You know, are easy to mix up too because they're both like kind of. You yeah, know. but one's an elf and one's a one's not. Well, this is true. The non-elven one. Yeah, that's my favorite. Eowyn. Eowyn. Yes. Yes. How about you? Um, I'd probably you know I think I'd probably just I'd probably go with Gandalf. Oh. I really love Gandalf. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I think Gandalf can be mean sometimes. That's why he's not my favorite. That's kind of what I like about him. I figured. I figured that was probably what you liked about him. <laughs> I he, he's just he's iconic, you know. Oh, he's totally I iconic. Mean, yeah. And let's face it, a you know, a good leader, especially when there's like mortal peril involved, like a good leader sometimes needs to be a little mean. Not not because he wants to be mean to people, but because it's like he needs to like whip them into shape and get them moving in the right direction yeah. quickly you know that's probably um, true you know he you know you know he doesn't hold a grudge he doesn't hold a grudge against poor pippin you know right he's yeah just, he's just like pippin deserves stop that. being I an agree. idiot <laughs> i agree yeah pippin did, did deserve what he got but see i think eowyn is an amazing leader and she's not mean 
Uh, she's, she's, also... she's she's pretty mean to the uh, to to the uh, Black Rider. Well, Black Rider had it coming. I mean, that was a matter of life and death. Yeah. But I you know I mean Gandalf does do cool fireworks. So. Yes, he does. He's he's legit. I would Dan. I would go with Gandalf. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's hard to pick from all of them, but I would I would probably go with Gandalf. Um, I might just, you know, I, I really like, um, I really like Luthien. Mm. So yeah, there's Luthien too. Anyway, let me read the rest of Dan's note. Aragorn is my favorite fictional character of all time because he shows the true strength of men. Aragorn is a really good mm-hmm. one. Probably top five for me. I would love to know how he stacks up against the heroes from the first and second ages. Tolkien has said that Hurin is the greatest warrior from the first age, I believe, but I was wondering what your thoughts were. Pure might and battle prowess, there is uh, there is a never-ending debate, especially if you brought elves into the discussion as well. Turin, Tuor, and Ecthelion of the Fountain are some of my personal favorites, but Fingolfin has always been the best from the First Age, in my opinion, chiefly because of his duel with Morgoth. Even though I first read the Silmarillion when I was 11, that imagery has stuck with me for the past decade. Thank you guys, and looking forward to the new episodes. Yeah, um, I mean, I... You know, I I would love, I would love to list uh, Luthien amongst all of those, right? And um, and I say that because I think she's a, she's a surprising, like you don't think of her as a warrior, mm-hmm. but she absolutely whoops some tail. Yeah, she does. I was gonna use the more colorful version of that phrase, so it's a good <laughs> thing that you said it first. This is a clean family <laughs> podcast, Greta. So. You're right. So, like I said, good thing you said it first. I agree. I put Luthien up there with those guys for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, just in terms of being, I, I, I love her as that idea. I mean, all the, all the warriors you listed off, Dan, are, are good, are definitely great ones. Um, and you know, the, the image of Fingolf and like battle, doing battle with Morgoth, you know, is 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 really an awesome one. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think. Um, Luthien for me, like she's just um, like it's it's funny because you just you expect Baron to be the big to big be the big hero of the story. And to be fair, I mean Baron's Baron's pretty tough. He mm-hmm. do, he he can mm-hmm. do some damage. He but some. I just love that Luthien is um, first of all she like her incredible heritage, and then second of all like that she just like sings and uh, and conquers through singing. So and then conquers through singing. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Uh, good stuff, Dan. Yeah. Great to hear from yeah, you. Thank you. And let's see. We have a note from Tom M. from January 25th. Tom says, it was Thingle. Thingle, <laughs> Luthien's father. After Baron opened his empty hand, Thingle had compassion on him. So when we were talking, I think we were talking with Caitlin. It was the episode we talked with Caitlin. And we were like, um, yeah, we we were talking about the, when Baron opens, you know, uh, like opens his empty hand and there's no, there's nothing there. Mm-hmm. Right. Who was that? That was like, um, who, who, who was that? That was, that had compassion. Oh, on him? could we not remember his yeah, name? Yeah. We, we couldn't remember who it was, but it was okay. Thingle. It, it was, it was Thingle, uh, who is Luthien's father. Gotcha. So, yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Yes. Appreciates it. Mm-hmm. All right. And, uh, and then lastly from Timothy D., March 2nd, I thought, with an interesting little thought experiment. Um, He says, Hello, John and Greta. Here's an interesting thought. What if the Tolkien estate produced a new Silmarillion? The text would have the appearance or illusion of completion, like the 1977 Silmarillion. However, the editors would take into account Christopher's scholarly work in the history of Middle-earth, as well as the regrets that he voiced about his treatment of the 1977 Silmarillion. If done well, this process would probably enhance the Silmarillion as a literary work, especially in the eyes of a new generation, while inevitably irritating the current generations of fans that have become emotionally and intellectually attached to the 1977 Silmarillion. Hmm. Here's a reasonably similar example. The original Star Wars trilogy was originally released from 1977 to 1983. From 97 to 2005, the original creator George Lucas transformed the Star Wars universe through the special edition and the prequel trilogy. The 1997 special edition was released featuring numerous changes, big and small, including new computer-generated special effects, alternations to the musical score by the original artist John Williams, and two new previously deleted scenes from Star Wars, now subtitled A New Hope. Special edition is a misnomer since this is a standard version nowadays. The prequel trilogy expanded and changed interpretations of Star Wars by telling a new backstory. 
The older generations that became hardcore fans of Star Wars before 97 to 2005 often strongly disliked the special editions along uh, and, the, and the prequels. <clears throat> the younger generations that became hardcore fans of Star Wars after these dates, including myself, often has a much more positive view of both the special editions and the prequel trilogy. The most notable difference is that the elder Tolkien has been dead since before the publication of the 1977 Silmarillion, while George Lucas is still alive today. Another notable difference is that due to physical limitations, books are easier to substantially edit than films are. Thank you for the excellent podcast. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, well, we already, you know, we already talked a little bit about, you know, updating the Silmarillion to include like a frame narrative, which I kind of mm-hmm. like that idea. I like that idea. Um, so why not, you know, um, why not go back and, you know, maybe keep the original one intact, but then have a, you know, expanded Silmarillion or something like that, right? Um, or ex- the Silmarillion special edition or something like that. Um, that maybe just includes like some of the key, the like key highlights that, uh, you know, from the history of Middle Earth to kind of supplement what's in, um, you know, what's in the Silmarillion. But I don't know, it you know, it's, uh, you know, it's it's always it, it's as uh, as Doc Brown would say it's it's always dangerous to mess with the space time continuum. <laughs> so um, I think for me, Star Wars is a good example of that rule, right? Um, you know, I I literally have uh, I I have the VHS tapes of the of the Star Wars of the like the original versions of the Star Wars movies, and because those are the ones I grew up with, and I and I burned them to DVD a few years ago, so that I would have them. Uh, I would have them forever, right? And I even like when I ha- had my kids watch it for the first time; those were the versions they watched, right? Now you know, everybody, you know, Disney Plus, and you everybody watches the special editions, which are the official versions, I guess now. But but for me, the original ones will always, you know, the the real Star Wars movies will always be the uh, the ones that I have on VHS, you know, that I bought in like the mid '90s before the special editions came out. So um, anyway, I you know. I feel like the sky's the limit when it comes to what what the future of Tolkien publications um, actually is. So mm-hmm. I'm open to all kinds of different ideas. Uh, I just want them whatever they're done, whatever's done, to be executed well, right? right, and to be up to the quality of what Tolkien would want. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's tough. It's really tough. But I don't just want it to become like something where it's just let's let's just churn out a hundred new Tolkien books, Middle Earth books every year. And if they're garbage, they're garbage, but they're going to sell like hotcakes, right? Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, but anyway, Timothy, thanks for the note. Great thoughts. Um, and fun little thought experiment. So, um, all right. Well, I think that's it. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. So we'd love to hear from you. Tolkien road podcast at gmail.com. TolkienRoad.com, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc. On our next episode, we will begin our search. Uh, I need I didn't update these notes. On our next episode, we will <laughs> we will um, we will survey the Book of Lost Tales. There we go. Part one. Okay. Yeah. So all the chapters in it. So there you go. Sounds like a plan. That's all for this episode. Thank you to our amazing patron patrons, especially the following. Caitlin of T with Tolkien. Lise U. Andrew T. John R. Ms. Anonymous. Shannon S. Brian O. Emilio P. Zeke F. James A. James L. Chris L. Chuck F. Asia V. Ish of the Hammer. Teresa C. David of Pints with Jack. Jonathan D. Eric S. Joey S. Eric B. Matt L. Johanna T. Sam N. Mike M. Du- <laughs> Duren Ayer. Duren Ayer. And Robert H. Thanks, guys. And also, uh, shout out to Caitlin of T with Tolkien, who is celebrating her patron anniversary in March. Yay! Yeah. So, our only March anniversary as of right now. So, but a oh. bunch of you could sign up right now and uh, become patrons this month, like <clears throat> a few already have. And then you will have an anniversary next year for us to recognize. So, yeah. Sounds like a, a good March. idea to me. Yeah. All right, y'all. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening, and we will talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye bye. <laughs>